This season of On the Contrary by IDR is supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant and peaceful world. More information at mechfound.org. You're listening to On the Contrary by IDR, a show featuring unlikely conversations on topics that affect our future. Hear differing perspectives from leaders and experts as they help us make sense of the most pressing issues of our time. Here's your host, Smarnita Shetty. When we talk about the impacts of the climate crisis, we talk about how air pollution, erratic weather, rising temperatures, and disasters are changing our spaces and our lives. There might also be conversation about how it's affecting those most vulnerable, whether they are marginalized communities or those living near disaster-prone areas. But we often tend to treat those at the grassroots as one big group of people with similar aspirations, responsibilities, and access to resources. What often gets missed out in these conversations, though, or rather who gets missed out, are the women who are burdened to care for their homes, their children, and their families. To explore the impacts of climate change on women, the solutions that are emerging, and how policies can make space for their voices, we have with us today on the show Archana Soreng and Bijal Ben. Archana Soreng belongs to the Khadia tribe from Odisha. She's one of the seven members of the United Nations Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. She's experienced in advocacy and research and is working to document, preserve, and promote traditional knowledge and cultural practices of indigenous communities. Bijal Pramabhat, or Bijal Ben, is the director of Mahila Housing Trust. Her work for over 20 years has been in the areas of formal and informal housing and habitats in urban India. Her programs have helped women participate in city-level initiatives in order to start making cities more inclusive. Over the last several years, MHT has focused extensively on helping women build localized solutions for cooling in urban slums. Bijal Ben, you've been working with women in the informal sector across urban slums for over two decades now. What have you been seeing in terms of how climate change is impacting women in these communities? So we actually, we have been working with uh, poor women in informal sector across India and now also a little bit across the global South, Nepal and Bangladesh. And climate change is not only everything about disasters, but it is also about slow onset, but potent stresses like heat or air pollution or, for example, water resource management, because water scarcity is going to be one. It is, and it's going to be even aggravated further because of climate change. Uh, similarly, vector bond is one area, and flooding are the areas that we have been working on, especially in urban. Most of these women uh, are working from their houses. They are home-based workers also. And see, the heat uh, is much aggravated in their houses. And that actually impacts their productivity by around 30% in hot season. Uh, I can give you one example where areas in Bihar where we have been working get flooded very often due to you know the Ganga overflowing in monsoon season. And they usually climb on top of their houses. And it's the women who get down first and uh, start cleaning up the muck due to the floods in the house. And then they get a snake bite. So you will eventually see that the mortality rate of women is increasing after such a flooding disaster because there are snakes in the muck. So it acts very um, differently uh, for women who are more vulnerable. And of course, uh, due to vector uh, bond disease breaking out, you know, like Malaria, dengue, chikungunya, all are going to increase and the dual care burden. So it's a question of productivity, economic productivity, especially being impacted for women. Also, you know, things like probably mortality rate and care burden uh, certainly increase for women. Thank you, Bijal Ben. Archana, do you want to speak a little bit about the communities you work in? How is climate change impacting them? And how are women being impacted by the crisis versus the rest of the population? I think one of the key thing when we talk about impacts of climate crisis from a lens of indigenous people and local communities and rural communities is that A, there's still not 
mapping and in-depth studies on degrees of impacts of climate crisis. And what I have felt and realized and observed is that we have a certain set of understandings in terms of what is impact and we only cater to it. If I give you one example, when we are having a situation like floods, it's very critical situation in the coastal areas, like the house are, you know, taken away, the communities are affected, and it is a very, very difficult situation for the communities on coastal areas. But people often fail to also acknowledge that how that floods and rainfalls also impacts communities in the plains. Like the communities, those who are living on the plains who are dependent on agriculture, like having that continuously uh, frequent rains in a not an appropriate season also makes it a loss of agriculture, loss of livelihood and specifically loss of forest based livelihood for the indigenous and local communities also. And this having regularly also pushes them into the verge of debt. So even if it is not a direct impact like, you know, taking away of house, but it's also of taking away of livelihood, which is also equally heavily impacted by climate crisis. Now, when I talk about this, who is the one who is most impacted on this? It falls on the women and children because forest-based livelihood is one of the major source of earning for the women. And it's also a major source of money for which uh, helps them to pursue education for the children. The men of the family are forced to push forward for other jobs like as laborers or move out of the villages and go to the cities. And again, the responsibility of taking care of the communities, the household work, again falls with the women and also this falls along with taking care of the forest. So that's why it's also very important to see that how women are being affected by climate crisis. Drawing upon that point, because women are more severely impacted by the climate crisis, are you both seeing them come up with climate solutions either to kind of lessen the effect or then to adapt? Bijalban, could you talk a little bit about the women you're working with? What is their understanding of the issue? And how are they working around its impact on their lives? Some of the solutions, uh, you know, may be much more traditional and in use. For example, if you are looking uh, during the heat season, they may deploy, uh, uh, you know, uh, food that reduces the impact of heat because it's been a traditional solution. So without knowing or without understanding that climate change is going to ex exacerbate the heat uh, situation, they deploy it because it has been a tradition. Women, for example, would drink more uh, buttermilk or probably use of more onions uh, in the food, uh, especially during the hot season. These kind of remedies have always been there traditionally. But uh, some of the other climate areas, like say air pollution or say, for example, water scarcity or say flooding and vector borne disease, we have observed that because the women are so poor, they think extremely short term. So their energies will be concentrated on how to get water for the day, how to get the fees of your children, uh, otherwise their schooling will be impacted, how to get the uh, raise the resources so that you are ensured that the next meal in your family is there on the plate. And that is what really, uh, you know, engages their attention. But climate change would also... Uh, need a little bit of long-term thinking and intergenerational thinking. I think the other issue that we find, especially with the poor, is that, you know, the technocrats uh, and the scientists actually make it a very heavy jargon-based technical principle that the women are not actually able to understand. So one of the big jobs that we have been doing is to be able to actually demystify this scientific language or uh, technical language so that the women can understand it extremely easily and then plan their actions around it more specifically and make it more relevant is one big job that we are trying to do with them. 
Can you also give us a few examples of the solutions that you're seeing roll out on the ground? For example, air conditioners will not work for the poor just because it's so costly and they may not even have access to a proper grid connection. So some of the things that we have been trying to do, for example, is trying to work on technologies which cool down their houses, but they are still not uh, as costly or unaffordable uh, as the air conditioners and which will suit their other needs. So we have been trying to work on cool roofs, for example. We have been trying to issue housing loans where there are passive designs, uh, solutions like, you know, for example, if you have wall overhangs or window overhangs, you know, protrude out. And so the direct sun rays don't fall on your window, then the heat gets reduced by one or two uh, degrees. So such solutions uh, we have been trying out, not only in heat, for example, uh, as the water becomes scarce, we have also been propagating in areas where they already have piped water connection, things like sprinkler taps, which are very, very cheap. But, uh, you know, we'll reduce water usage by almost 50%. We have mapped that so that they do not further contribute to the uh, issue of water scarcity. So we have been trying to do this with the women. You're listening to On the Contrary by IDR. We'll be right back after this break. Most of us don't like to fail. And so we try and avoid it at all costs. But failure is natural, and there can be no success without it. In fact, it teaches us invaluable lessons about what not to do and how to make things right. IDR's new podcast, Failure Files, puts stories of failure front and center, where you can listen to candid perspectives and lessons from social entrepreneurs working on some of the world's toughest problems. Listen and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting app. And now, back to the show. Archana, Bijal Ben touched upon how expertise, especially when it comes to climate action, often flows top-down. It tends to be very technical, and often the proposed solutions may not even be the solutions that people need. So how have you been seeing indigenous communities respond to the climate crisis and think of solutions? I think before going on to what communities are doing and what are the solutions we are witnessing or observing, I think it's also very important uh, to see how do we want to see solutions. Because for me, I think one of the key things which I have been advocating is the way of living of indigenous people itself is a solution. So for me, when we talk about solution, it's not only what indigenous people or local communities do, but who they are and how they have the relationship with nature and how they have been the way of living it is. How do we expect communities to speak about this when there has been years of inferiorization and making them feel low and bad about it? It needs to come from a place of respect. It needs to come from a place of solidarity and they seek solution or willingness to work together and that's why I keep my narrative as in like in three aspects which is like how indigenous people have been leading life with nature what is the world view the second is what are the eco-friendly practices or the livelihood or lifestyle practices? And the third is the governance structure. And that's why when I talk about the worldview, it is like for indigenous people and local communities, it's like nature and land is the source of identity, culture, tradition, and language, unlike commercial commodity as seen by other people. And for us, it's also very intrinsic because the loss of our forest, loss of our nature and loss of land is also loss of ourselves and our identity. And the second thing, if we speak about the way of living and eco-friendly practices, then I think one of the key thing has been like the way they wake up in the morning. They have been brushing their treats with the twigs of the forest. They have been eating twigs uh, of the trees. They have been eating on the leaflets and leaf bowls made by themselves. 
all of these have always existed in the communities but that's what it is like it's been looked down upon and then i think the important thing comes down to the governance like how indigenous people are contributing and what the solution is like they have those governance structures the community led forest protection practices in the villages where they take decision of you know protecting the forest where they have been going uh, patrolling to the forest and taking care of the forest like there's a thinga pali practices thinga means stick pali means turn so these are practices which is often seen in nayagar district of odisha in mayurbhanj district of odisha in devghar district of odisha and other parts of odisha women have been protecting the forest and women are going in turns of four and uh, patrolling the forest and they are taking the stick with them to patrol the forest and after they come back they keep the stick in front of the next home so in that way the stick is also rotating and the entire responsibility is also rotating amongst the women in the communities and the village and that's why i feel it's really really critical that if this communities rights are not recognized they are not safe and secure they always live in the fear of eviction and displacement so i think it's really important uh, for me to emphasize on what importance rights recognition of indigenous people and local communities over the land forest and territory has as a solution it's also important to see how preservation promotion and protection of the traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous communities have as a solution to climate action we do not have adequate representation of communities in national spaces decision making spaces or international spaces for that i think it's really important also to not homogenize indigenous people and local communities rather make sure that we have adequate representation from different regions and different contexts I think there's a great point you're making Archana that climate solutions have to be hyper local which is to say that one can't come up with solutions unless one knows the local context the history the culture of a particular region right because there's a tendency especially in the climate space to have experts come in and say this is what must be done but as we know that a lot of that knowledge probably already exists locally Bijal Ben Archana spoke a little bit about the need for more representation What are other things you think should happen at a policy level to actually help reduce the impacts of climate change or at least address some of it on vulnerable communities especially women So I think uh, you know currently so far as the Indian government policies are concerned it's largely focused only on renewable energy which is um, talking about mitigating the impacts of climate change how are the communities adapting because climate change is happening fast and while we do try to mitigate it may not get entirely mitigated so how do you also adapt along with mitigation and eventually everything that we do in terms of climate change has to lead towards resilience building of these communities resilience would mean not only being able to survive the impact of climate change but also to be able to thrive and continue thriving in the wake of uh, climate change so we need uh, policies which address all the three issues the second thing that i feel locally led adaptation strategies uh, should be given prominence which is what archana ji was also saying so currently it's an extremely top down approach third thing i have been observing is that there is a lot of talk around climate change however there is uh, not as much resources flowing really down to the ground so it has been mapped that uh, you know whatever uh, resources are being allocated hardly 10 to 14% really go down to action and on the ground solutions So I think that's a very big issue that uh, we really need to take cognizance. And the fourth thing, I do very strongly agree uh, that you know uh, there are no representational spaces. So what the communities are doing with the help of NGOs like ourselves is to claim these spaces in policy making. Like some of the women that we have been working with are actually setting up multi-stakeholder groups at city level where they have. the city governments scientists technologists and themselves talking to each other on these issues and meeting on a regular basis 
but these are spaces which have been created by us and which are claimed by the women but there are no invited spaces by the government or the business houses in india where you know they come by invitation they do not have to claim it so we still have to come up with that kind of an architecture in the policy making space absolutely bijal ben and everything you suggested these are all practical things that can be done they aren't out of reach finally i want to ask both of you belong to very different generations of women is there anything specific to how your generation is reacting to the crisis bijal ben if you would like to go first what really caught their attention i must say is that they were very clear that they did not want their children to leave the kind of lives that they were leading and when they understood that uh, you know it's even going to become more uh, worse because of climate change that's what really got them into action and we have been trying to uh, also you know train these women to take evidence locally as much as possible and start using technologies to capture evidence however one of the issues is with the women in our generation is that uh, you know as compared to some of the younger adolescent girls their adaptation to technology is a little bit slow of course one because smartphones are not a very handy to women more or less it's in the hands of men so one they don't have uh, access to it and second also they are more into traditional ways of collecting data probably physical surveys and do really need some push to uh, move over to technologies which is very easier for the younger generation adolescent girls but again the issue especially where women are concerned is that you know mobility for the elder women is much easier so if you want to go out if you want to represent if you want to talk then you know probably it's easier for the elder women who are married but uh, for adolescent girls especially in slums safety being an issue their mobility is very highly arrested so if you want to make this kind of representations from uh, you know younger women from adolescent girls then you know we need to start also addressing the issues of mobility and safety to ensure their public participation thank you bijal ben archana do you see your generation responding differently i think uh, for us it's like no longer waiting for impacts of climate crisis we are witnessing and living with impacts of climate crisis and we have also seen loss of lives and daily you know waking up to this that's why we see that how the youth movement on uh, climate action and environmental groups have been very very vocal about impacts of climate crisis and what needs to be done on to the policy levels and grassroots levels youth have been on the streets also and in decision making spaces and are also showing the skills and expertise but i think the still denial and believe on youth leadership i think that needs to change i think it's really really important to have safe and enabling spaces for young people and that's really really critical i would also like to link up with speaking up and leadership with things on ground if my rights over my land is not recognized i am living under the threat of eviction displacement then how will i be able to actively and efficiently be able to speak up or take up leadership position so that's why also when we talk about leadership of indigenous people and local community those things also needs to be taken into consideration uh, the third thing which i also feel that is really really important to emphasize on casteism uh, structural racism that we really need to put an end to this and make systematic changes i also would like to agree with uh, what bijal ji said in terms of fund allocation because we all have been seeing this discussions around climate finance but we barely do we see that the climate finance is translated to the communities and specifically communities on ground as we are leading up to cop 27 it's really important that the fund allocation for all of this climate mitigation adaptation and resilience reaches out to the people on the ground the women on the ground is what i believe and i think one of the last thing which i would like to say that it's really critical when we are talking about mitigation adaptation 
and resilience is that somewhere or the other preparedness gets diluted i think the element of preparedness also needs to be taken into consideration that how we can make sure that we are prepared for all of this crisis while mitigating climate change is crucial for people already facing the consequences of the crisis in terms of loss of livelihoods loss of habitat loss of health the climate emergency is very much a part of the reality today and so adapting to the crisis and building resilience is extremely important as well as policy makers work towards india's climate action goals there's a need to make space for more voices on the table those belonging to people who share a close relationship with the land they live on and those who perhaps understand nature and its patterns better than anyone else most importantly we need to make space for women's voices to be heard who are more often than not left out of the conversation entirely on the contrary by idr is produced by rachita vora smarnita shetty and me shreya adhikari production by made in india if you like our show please subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast from so more people can find out about us you can also email us on write to us at idronline.org or find us on facebook instagram twitter or linkedin thank you for listening 